Hi everyone and welcome to Liberty Me You. We're here tonight uh, with an author's forum to talk about the book Panarchy by Paul Emile Dupuy, which uh, Liberty Me has just released a version of with a new foreword by Max Borders. Uh, Max, if you're not familiar with him, is the editor of the Freeman Magazine and the director of content for the Foundation for Economic Education. He's also the author of Super Wealth, Why We Should Stop Worrying About the Gap Between Rich and Poor, and he's a writer and an innovator with a decade of experience in the nonprofit world. And uh, he, if you uh, weren't keeping up with this, he uh, put together an awesome conference down in Austin, Texas, the Voice and Exit Conference, uh, a couple of months ago that uh, I know uh, some of the people in chat I remember were going to. So uh, without further ado, Max Borders. Uh, I hope you can hear me OK. Uh, it's weird speaking to the void in these kind of situations, but I'm going to do that. And um, I hope that you'll, you'll flag Matt if there's anything that goes on that's a problem or anything like that. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you today about Panarchy. Uh, Paul Emile Dupuis is a Belgian who was writing in the 1800s about some really cutting edge ideas, and I think he was way ahead of the game. There's a certain pragmatic appeal about his ideas that I want to sort of tease out tonight, but I think from a, uh, there, there are certain limitations to the pragmatism of, of his work. That being said, I think it's a really promising direction for libertarianism as well. So the best place to start in talking about the work, uh, the work of his famous work, Panarchy, is to discuss the idea that politics is basically crap. Um, politics is acrimonious. It causes us to divide ourselves into tribes. We tend to, um, we tend to sort of try to, um, I don't know, wall ourselves off in our own little groups. And, and the, the, it just, it's a, the, state, the state of affairs that politics leaves us in is at best a spectator sport. We watch our teams to see how our team performs. And once they get into office, you know, if we're talking about electoral politics, they always, well, almost always fail us in terms of our desires at the voting booth. We, we basically go to the voting booth and we send up our prayers and they rarely get answered. So what he was on to is another way. And now let me back up from that um, because, you know, we do know that politics is a game of, we, we don't tend to think of, unless we're uh, in this group, we think of it as guns and jails, but most people don't think of it as guns and jails. They think of it as, how do we put it? Um, ballots versus bullets. And so it has always seemed like sort of the democratic republic is a state of affairs that gives us a relatively peaceful transfer of power. We get to choose our masters and we don't have to do it uh, by being conscripted into, into a warfare situation or whatever. And it's really interesting in that respect because uh, the Democratic Republic is really interesting in that respect, and in, in, in that it was a it was an upgrade, I guess you could say, from from systems of the past. But the problem is, um, it's this sort of social operating system that we're we're living under right now is kind of buggy, and and the bugs are starting to reveal themselves. And in important respects, we don't get you know choosing our masters is not ideal. So what do we do about it? Let me let me come back to that in in, in a second. Um, broadly speaking, what's really appealing, I think, to a lot of us about libertarianism is not that it's rah-rah freedom, although that's part of it too, but it's also the fact that libertarianism is asymmetrical with respect to other kinds of political systems in that it is a political superstructure that allows for the widest range of possible other systems to be subsumed, subsumed under its umbrella. So, for example, Let's suppose we had a liber liberty.me kibbutz or liberty me kibbutz, and we all decided we wanted to share resources equally in this kibbutz. Within a broader libertarian framework, that would be totally kosher as long as you and I or anyone else had a right of exit. And that's really what's interesting about panarchy um, and other forms of competitive governance is that you have a right of exit. That's the only uh, deal breaker, I guess you could say, is that 
you, you'd be able to exit. So this political superstructure is interesting in that respect. And I think it makes for a, a pragmatic, um, a pragmatic way of going forward as an alternative to electoral politics. It's going to be interesting to people, at least who are open minded. So the idea, the basic idea in, in, in Depuy, I guess is how you pronounce it, is that you be able to choose your own governance structure. It's self secession, I guess you could say. And secessionism has gotten a bad rap because it's been associated with, of course, with American slavery and so on. But there are other words for secession that are good words that uh, the UN and people and, and people associated with sort of the international sphere like, such as self-determination. So it is really self-determination on steroids, but it is not a complete full anarchy. It is a pragmatic middle ground. So, um, you know, the anarchist among us just is sort of like it's a be patient step, but we're getting there. And um, and panarchy is a way of unpacking this idea that you should be able to choose your own governance structures. So the way the way the tweet puts it is imagine you could be in your slippers and choose uh, you could choose monarchy, you could choose democratic republic, you could choose your Swedish healthcare system, whatever you like. It's that simple really. Um, and you and I, you might be in London, you might be in Germany, you might be in 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 um, in sub-Saharan Africa, we might be in different places all over the world with different ethnic backgrounds, but we share common values. Maybe we share some value that is we believe that uh, health care is quote unquote a basic right and all other forms of goods and services are left to the common market, but we think health care is a different situation. We'd probably be wrong from an economic standpoint, but we want to try it. So you and me and some others would get together in our healthcare and uh, in a, in a healthcare club, and we would we would buy into a a political platform that instead of a party that would be engaging in a kind of I guess you'd call it king of the mountain or 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 what would you would you say a tug of war between groups we would select our healthcare system now. If that healthcare system sucked, we would really get defectors quickly, and other alternative systems would be better. Maybe a Singaporean system with large medical savings accounts would be far better from an economic standpoint, but that would bear out in the actual real world marketplace. We would discover that and we would be able to defect. So the next year we'd say, I want out of this bizarre healthcare system and I want to go into that one. But we are opting into a governance structure of certain sorts where we would agree to have a certain level of taxation or fees or whatever you want to call it, a certain level of our income or sales taxes and so on be taken out for this purpose and we would agree to that. So we'd be sort of contracting into, <laughs> it would be the real social contract. I've written an article called The Real Social Contract from which um, much of the introduction to this new edition of uh, Panarchy was taken. And the idea here is that you can contract into or join a club with a certain bundle of goods and services, and that's just okay, and that these compete. These competing, this makes it a nice subset of libertarianism, broadly speaking, and in many respects, a pragmatic middle ground. Um, so the idea here is migration or the right of exit is important. You want to be able to get around out of a situation that stinks. So currently we have Burger King uh, that is trying to get out of the United States. Not United States. They bought Tim Hortons. I don't know if it was for tax reasons or not, but suppose it is. The uh, United States has the highest rate of marginal ta uh, corporate taxation in the world. And therefore, a lot of companies are migrating to other countries with more favorable tax climates. That's perfectly reasonable from the standpoint of a company that's trying to maximize profits for both shareholders and keep prices low for customers. Um, of course, people who love taxes and love to gobble them up for their own utopian projects don't like it. And of course, that's why we're hearing a lot of the whinging that we are. And of course, the nativists who want to see Burger King stay a good old Merck and company. But there 
the idea is that people will, when they have an opportunity to get a better situation for themselves, will migrate. And what panarchy suggests is that this need not be tied so much to territory. So I would put it like this to someone who is a statist. Say, if you're in your county and there's something that you don't like, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be someone like where I'm from in Austin, here in Austin, Texas, who has decided they like all the light rail projects, they like all these wonderful boondoggles in town, but they're not willing to pay for them with higher rates of taxation. They're going to be willing, like some of the folks here, as progressive as they may say they are, willing to migrate. So they migrate to another county, a county that perhaps doesn't have the glorious benefits of 18th century uh, technology, such as light rail. And so they don't have to pay the higher levels of taxation. So when we think about jurisdictions being tied to territory in specific ways, we look at the wonderful benefits of technology around us, and this is where we we build the idea of sort of techno-optimism onto the, the older ideas of Dupuy, de, de and we say, hey, look, we've got opportunities to create panarchic structures that are independent of territory. It would be easy, as I say, to join a club that includes people from, um, from Libya, from, from uh, Canada, from the United States, from Mexico, and so on, all of whom share a common interest in a certain kind of governance structure because they believe that will be a benefit them and their family, uh, defectors notwithstanding. So this is really uh, about competitive governance and technology as such really um, makes it us able to to defect more easily. It lowers the cost of exit. Now, Leviathan, of course, is going to raise the cost of exit at the same time, so we have to figure out ways to, to, to hack systems to find our own governance, governance structures and, uh, work and operate in parallel with the Leviathan state, but I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that in just a moment. This is where I think um, the question, now let me quote uh, for just a moment from Panarchy. He says, he's asked by his interlocutor, he says, um, he says, how are you going to put this into practice, may I ask? And he answers, this is precisely my strong point. Do you know how a civil registry office works? It is just a matter of making a new application of this. In each community, a new office is opened, a Bureau of Political Membership. Now, don't be afraid by the idea of a bureau. He's saying that there's some sort of civil administration of this larger panarchic um, scheme where people can join their own political groups and constituencies and live under the auspices they choose. Says, this office would send every responsible citizen a declaration form to fill in just as for an income tax or dog registration. Okay, so I don't have much of a problem with the fact that some sort of civil administration would, would, would be the steward of the system, except we know how corruptible they are. I think the wider problem that, uh, that he doesn't face in this piece is what we would to, that his uh, contemporary, I think, um, uh, Bastiat would have said, which is the, the desire for people to be uh, how should we say, plunderers <laughs> using the state. And so the, special, the problem of special interest, which we now call uh, in contemporary language public choice economics. So how do we deal with that? We know that Leviathan is in the pockets of special interest, corporatism is rampant problem, and choosing your own governance structure is going to be difficult. It's sort of, there's a, there's a, um, there's a problem with any sort of ideology, whether it's libertarian or otherwise, and that is public choice. Special interests make it very difficult to reform matters, even if you have pop popular support. So even if tomorrow we were to go out and we have a wildfire of libertarian ideas and people were just suddenly just got it, just like all of you here do, 
there's a problem with the fact that the state the state corporate complex the relationships between state and corporation corporations sends it down historically on a path and it's very diff difficult to cross the tracks I hope you see what I mean by crossing the tracks the, there is a kind of nihilism that if you listen to the public choice theorists it's really difficult to get off the tracks of the special interest state there are exceptions to how you deal with this but another I idealism in response to public choice problems is not as pragmatic as, as panarchy may be is not really all that uh, feasible there are pragmatic considerations involved. Sure, it would be really easy to implement if there were the quote unquote political will to implement it. But that's a big if. The special inter the problem of special interests goes all the way down. And I readily, readily acknowledge that despite my love of this set of ideas uh, that 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 uh, that Dupuy in the 18th century presented to us. So what do we do about that? Um, I think the answer lies in um, what we might call state hacking or Leviathan hacking. And right now you are participating in a kind of grand social experiment. We're all talking, we're all interacting based on liberty.me's rules or liberty.me's rules. Liberty.me has a set of rules, they have a set of protocols internal to their system that we've all agreed to. Um, I've agreed to, to be presented in bits and bytes and sound waves to you today by virtue of something called EPROF. Okay, that was chosen by the stewards of this, this nested so social operating system in this sort of community club that is Liberty Me. There could be changes to the social operating system internal to this community, but the interesting thing about it is it is you are sitting right now and participating in a kind of proof of concept a proof of concept that alternative governance arrangements can work and that is a is a fascinating thing see uh, many of you who are watching this today and if you're old guys like me i apologize you know it stinks to get old but hey i'm, I'm right there with you but some of you watching are digital natives that means you've grown up in a state of affairs where interacting socially and otherwise and commercially and otherwise um, on social media, on the internet, and so on, is, is as natural to you as breathing. And once humanity susses and realizes that, that this um, way of interacting with other people is pluralistic, is natural, that a right of exit is expected online. Once we realize, once you trans, transfer the, this way of thinking about interaction online onto our territori territorial governance structures through jurisdiction, um, then we will start to see more of a questioning of the social operating systems that govern territory because they're really old and they're really buggy and they're really shitty. Excuse my mouth. So <clears throat> that is where I think we have a lot of promise. I want to see, uh, I would like to see us think about how we might update uh, Dupuy's uh, system in the 21st century, because really we are already living the dream online. It's now time to transfer this sort of social networking governance where you join groups and defect from them depending on the value that is conferred um, where we have this hyper philanthropy, where we have crowdsourcing, where we have other mechanisms for social change that are online and very natural to us until we step outside of this, this uh, cyber sphere, it seems like we go back to our own ways. And by we, I don't mean the people listening to this. I just mean people who are living in, in their everyday life, jobs, going to the voting booth, sending up their prayers and and having them not be answered in the special interest state that is crappy politics of today. Um, now, this that James C. Scott wrote a book recently, 
and I don't think he's a libertarian per se, but he wrote a great book recently called Two Cheers for Anarchy. And what he said is that once people realize that power structures are unable to, uh, to control them or it just gets crappy enough that they don't care whether they control them, that they would rather dig in and do what they want to anyway. They lock arms and do it en masse that, um, that they will. They simply will. And it's, he calls it Irish democracy. The Irish did it uh, against British rule for years and years. But when we do that with technological means and we are able to establish massive constituencies online, this problem of special interest starts to evaporate. And here's how. Here's a big punchline, and I hope you'll listen closely and make a note of this. Um, Carl Oberg articulated this, uh, this point, I think, the most clearly I've ever had it put. It was sort of swimming around in my head as a, as a kind of... Um, as a concept that wasn't fully formed, but he put it in very succinct terms in the following ways. Mansur Olson, you may be aware, gave us the idea of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. Now, this is a fancy way of saying that special interests have a specific interest in mind with certain legislation or some certain law, and so they're going to be the squeaky wheels in Washington. They're going to be willing to engage in a kind of auction for political power. Whereas average voters, the costs of understanding any given subject for us, like mohair subsidies or whether or not a certain tank is used by the military or not, all these expenditures, all of these laws, um, most people don't know much about them. Even the big headline things like Obamacare, people didn't know what was in it, and we had to pass it to find out what was in it, right? So. What Mansur Olson said was, by virtue of this process of concentrated benefits dispersed costs, where the cost of any given legislation is dispersed onto us, that the special interest state was going to stick around a long time and give us crappy governance. And Mansur Olson was right. He was absolutely right. Gordon and Tulloch were also right about the problems of special interests. Here's the thing. Technology net networks people in interesting ways. It inverts that process to such a degree that now we're seeing interesting things happen. Okay, and this is making something like what Paul Emile de Poit, uh, what he envisioned, much more interesting to us. And that is the following: with when you network people, you get a situation where the state of affairs is such that. Um, Costs are concentrated and benefits are dispersed. And that means we have tech-enabled Irish de democracy at our fingertips. If we see the benefits of decentralization, we will seize it. It will become almost um, not a conscious process, but a, an evolutionary process. It will become a kind of flipping over just as the, the special interest process where power and, and money accrete together around nation's capitals, now that we're networking with each other and there are benefits to networking, we're seeing this process being inverted. That's not to say that the state isn't going to fight uh, tooth and nail to keep it from happening. It's not to say that they're not going to become that the agents of the state are not going to become more violent and more threatening to try to keep it from happening. But Irish democracy as James C. Scott described it, and as people who use parallel governance structures online are describing it, I believe, I hope anyway, is going to invert that process to such a great degree. You can see in um, 50 Ways to Leave Leviathan, Jeff Tucker and I wrote about some of these, some of these means, uh, Lyft, Uber, Airbnb, Bitcoin, you name it, they're all over, examples are all over the place, and they're, they're babies, they're less than five years old. Once people cotton on to this structure, that there, there's actual benefit in networking technologies that bring people together for benefits that allow you to answer the problem of special interests, I don't think there really will be any going back. It'd have to get really, really authoritarian indeed for, it to, for the process to reverse. Now, I may be kidding myself. I don't know. But I think that gives us lots of hope. Now, um, Going quickly back to um, let's uh, let's see let's go quickly back to the question of whether 
um, this works all the way down and gets us to anarchy? The answer is I don't know. Um, but I don't think, so this is a, what I would call a step towards asymptotic anarchy. Let's go as far as we can go towards anarchy and pragmatically realizing the problem of special interest, realizing the problem of political and corporate power and go as far as we can because human flourishing depends on it. It's not a question of whether one is ideal or minicrism or anarchism, who cares? Panarchy uh, is, to my mind, a way of showing people that if you think you're, it's okay to be able to move to, to Podunk, from Podunk County to Jackson County in order to um, not have to pay taxes for light rail or in order to be able to enjoy the benefits of that jurisdiction, that once you accept that that's okay, then it's a very short step to being able to say, well, why can't I be able to leave this jurisdiction and this set of governance structure, this social operating system, and go to another social operating system if that social operating system is able to work free of territory. And it's very clear, at least to me and to people here, I imagine, that certain kinds of governance structures are easily uh, administered free of territory. So that leaves us with a question. What about those governance structures that aren't? Maybe there are some kinds of governance structures that really are attached to territory and we need to have them tied uh, to, to neighborhoods or counties or, or even whole countries. I think the interim solution to that problem, and I, I don't necessarily think this is the case, but if we were to accept um, what the Catholics uh, created as an institutional rule many, many uh, uh, hundreds of years ago, a principle of subsidiarity, which is what we call federalism, then we'll be okay. If we take anything that is not a, a that is a non-territorial good or service, then that would be subject to Dupuy's panarchy. If we were to take Truly, let's say there are truly territorial goods. I'm not saying there are, but let us grant to the status that there are truly territorial goods. Then the best way to deal with those goods must certainly be hyperlocalization. That is a principle of subsidi subsidiarity which says the following. Everything, every task uh, in, in territorial goods or services should be carried out at the most local feasible level. So if our street ha is trying to overcome some sort of collective action problem and wants to put up lights, then it's a street level thing. If there is some sort of environmental problem that crosses jurisdictions but doesn't go much further, um, then it should be handled locally. Perhaps it could be a province of the common law where the common law holds sway in a certain area, but we all respect the common law and it is allowed to, uh, to evolve within a, a jurisdiction. But that the jurisdictions are small, they would be sort of Jefferson's, uh, what did he call them, tiny republics, or, or um, in any case, Jefferson had a term for it, it fails me right now. Um, but this idea of if you, and, and, and the anarchist could come along and say, you don't need this, you privatize everything, and you get structures like malls and malls and um, homeowners associations and told freeways and so on. Fine, whatever you whatever you can come up with. If you can overturn, if you can overturn the uh, the ter territorial governance structures that's highly localized, which would be super big improvement over what we have now. Then fine, that's great. I would I would certainly follow that asymptotically towards anarchy. But if not. We would have a state of affairs that's so much better than what we have now, and everything else would be panarchy. We would choose our governance structures. And this, of course, would be no different from what is allowed under any broad conception of libertarianism. So I hope that this has been a, an interesting and uh, updated set of ideas from the 18th century. And Ward Republics, I see. Yes, BK Marcus, thank you very much. Similar to Switzerland, yes, indeed. Matt, thank you very much. Switzerland's um, uh, cantons are 
very similar to what I mean. And the cantons are are more powerful than the federal government, and that is as it should be. <clears throat> so, um, I'd like to open it up to questions right now. Um, please hold your tomatoes to the end of the set, but otherwise, questions fire away. All right, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask in text in the questions tab to the right, or if you'd like to come on video and ask, you can click video chatting up above the chat window and then click start your webcam, and I'll be able to bring you on screen. Our first question is from BK Marcus. He says, you clearly see great potential in digital networking. How do you feel about CSTED? Oh, yeah, thanks for asking. I think CSTEDing is what you might call a version of de facto rather than de jure um, panarchy. So competitive governance can be realized in a lot of different ways. The assumption with uh, Dupuy in the in the 1800s, or sorry, in the 18th century, was it, I can't remember which year, I think it was the 1800s, it was 19th century, in any case, um, his assumption was that it would be realized eventually through political means so that you would have this agreement within the structure that we have now, essentially, or whatever structure he was living under, which was, you know, uh, sort of probably Belgian monarchy. I don't think he was living in a liberal regime at the time, but he was aware of liberal regimes around him. And... And the idea that we would realize this through structures that are uh, current structures of a special interest state is probably not terribly realistic. However, if you look at it as um, that would be the de jure form. Internally, everybody, popular vote decides that we're going to adopt this structure, maybe through a constitutional amendment or something. Not going to happen. However, seasteading. Well, I'm not, I don't want to say not going to happen. Let me come back to that in a minute. Seasteading, though, says we're going to do it in a de facto way, uh, which means that we're going to go out on the sea, we're going to establish our own city-states, or they're going to have their own governance structures. We're going to modularize in such a way that if we don't like the governance structures, we simply will exercise the right of, right of exit, and we're going to float our boats away and cluster with other people with whom we share common values. So this is de facto versus de jure arising from within the law. However, um, startup cities, or uh, which used to be known as free cities, that uh, Zachary Caceres is working on people and Michael Strong, people like that in Honduras, that is a de jure form. They are working on, they're not perfect libertopias, but they are working on liberal city-states within the larger framework, federal framework of Honduras. Nobody knows if they're going to win yet, if they're going to work, but they're working on them. So both forms are possible, these de facto and de jure forms where you just go out on the sea or go to freaking, what's his name, um, flies us to the moon and, and we start moon colonies and, li you know, live the moon is a harsh mistress kind of state of affairs. And suddenly we just establish our own rule sets. Um, that might be one direction. Seasteading might be one direction. But there are also the Chinese over the past years have had established special economic zones or SEZs uh, that have been very successful in certain respects in terms of the liberalization of their economy. They're not perfect. They're not libertopia, but they're something. So these happen in both ways. And I think you could make a continuum here. Let me get my fingers in there. A continuum between happens through law. Uh, and happens through some sort of Irish democracy, right? Which is you just freaking do it. And seasteading would be closer to this end. Um, and uh, Hunter and Zeds, Z E D E S, which is uh, an acronym, Spanish acronym for these special economic zones, would be on would be on this end. I hope that answered your question. That was kind of a a whole bunch of thoughts, but I hope it answered your question, BK. Um, Adam Knott asks, uh, Max, when are you going to host a Panarchy Symposium at Fee? Oh, man, I would love to. 
And I didn't realize Adam Knott was on here. He is he's actually probably should have given this. He's the in my mind one of the foremost uh, uh, experts on this subject. And I hope I did him proud tonight. I I certainly would love to. This is the kind of wonky stuff I love to do. We have a um, in our mission an age demographic issue where we try to reach out to the um, to newcomers to liberty. So the extent to which I can talk about kind of wonky crap like this and excite young people, then I can get away with it. Otherwise, you know, we got to talk about stuff like, you know, just making sure people understand opportunity costs, comparative advantage, and, you know, what seasteading actually is versus, uh, versus the, this, this kind of stuff. But maybe, maybe I'm wrong in, in thinking that this isn't exciting. I tried to frame it in a couple of talks I've done as, as, Imagining what our world would look like if our governance structures looked more like the apps on an iPad than a two app uh, phone with a red app and a blue app. And people love that metaphor because they immediately grok it. Um, yeah, uh, good question, Adam. I, I, I really hope to do it. Uh, send a bunch of letters to the, to the higher ups at Fee and, and uh, emails. Maybe they'll let me do it. I appreciate your use of the word grok. It's uh, very fitting to use uh, a Heinlein created word in this particular discussion. I, I, I was just thinking another uh, essay on this subject that I wanted to plug because it's one of the ones that really got me plugged into the idea when I was getting serious about liberty is uh, Roderick Long's Virtual Cantons. It really kind of uh, introduced the idea of a territorial uh, panarchy to me. Uh, a few years back, I'll link that in chat here. Um, oh, but yeah, awesome. I, are, are, I want to pull you, that up myself. Do you foresee any problems, particularly with uh, the startup cities approach? Sure. Oh, there's all kinds of problems that could happen. Um, as with any approach, I mean, seasteading too. Seasteading too, I said, is more of an Irish democracy kind of phenomenon where you make it happen. You hack Leviathan, you go out and do it on your own. But they're living in, in international law. Um, you know, they have to be either 12 miles out from land or 24 miles out from land in order to have uh, these sorts of uh, governance structures. One to the other will change based on international law norms. And Leviathan states on land will use international law to justify all sorts of uh, um, screwing with the seasteaders, basically. That being said, um, uh, startup cities ha have similar risks involved. You've got, suddenly you've got people all around you who are making lots of money because they're enjoying the benefits of parallel governance and they will be predator predators and they'll, they will surround you. Now, luckily, China hasn't succumbed. The Chinese city-states, Shenzhen province and Hong Kong and all these others have not succumbed to uh, the Chinese Communist Party primarily because they don't want to kill the, the geese that lay the golden eggs. And I think that is also, but they are also inherently corporatist because of it. So they're going to be set down this path of concentrated benefits and dispersed cost until their people are able to find workarounds. So they, you know, as, as wonderful as it is that they started to liberalize circa 1980 was the beginning of the agricultural reforms. Um, they're going to suffer from the same problems, special interests, accretions. The governors in these, these Chinese provinces enjoy lots of kickbacks. You know, companies have to pay off officials. There's a, there's a dirty collusion that goes on between corporate interests and government and often the corporations on the government are the same in China. It's the same as in the United States, just difference of degree. And uh, I see no reason why startup cities won't, won't have to fight off these same phenomena, but that doesn't mean they're not worth doing. They were worth doing in China. Absolutely. People have millions and millions of people have been brought out of poverty, poverty in the last 30 years. And same as in India, 
you know, China and India between them are responsible for bringing the great swath of humanity out of poverty for the last 30 years. And it's incredible what they've been able to achieve. So even if, if Honduras goes in, in imperfectly, it's better than um, abject poverty and a place that's ruled by cartels that exist because of the drug war. Absolutely. Now I'm going to put out a last call for questions here, and in the meantime, I'm going to tell people about uh, what's going on here at Liberty Me You in the next week. Uh, tomorrow night we've got Naomi Brockwell. Uh, she's going to be talking about Liberty on Film, why everyone should be a filmmaker, about low-budget filmmaking. Uh, Friday, Friday night we've got Belen Marti of the Pan Am Post. She's going to be talking about what's going on in Argentina. Uh, Saturday night we've got Dana Martin. She, she'll be talking about radical unschooling and peaceful parenting. Sunday night, uh, Jeffrey Tucker is going to be continuing his Liberty Classics series with As We Go Marching by John T. Flynn. Uh, Monday night, I'm really excited about this one. Uh, Zach Slayback is going to deliver a talk entitled, Do You Hate the State? A Qualified Defense of Hatred and Contempt in Politics. He's going to be hoping to put a little hate in your heart. And then uh, Tuesday night, David Friedman is going to be here talking about the new edition of The Machinery of Freedom. So I hope to see you all back here at Liberty Me You in the next week. Uh, Matthew asks, funny how politically and economically incestuous status societies are. Can bottom-up panarchist initiatives get around this? Yes, absolutely. And if we don't believe it, it'll never happen. We've got to be relentlessly optimistic. We've got to die trying. We've got to adopt whatever technological means um, we can. We've got to be techno agorists. We've got to be. Uh, we've got to be creative, entrepreneurial in the face of the state. And yes, I believe it can happen, because once we lock arms, once we show people the benefits of uh, collaboration, cooperation online, there will be no turning back. The state will be obsolete. I'm going to come out with actually two pieces next week that uh, are a bit of a departure from the regular libertarian fair um, that I just wanted to share with the world and I didn't know what to do with it and I decided just to publish it with fee because I can um, and I, I sort of set out this optimistic vision in that it's not particularly um, a how-to manual for doing this but it's more an inspiration inspirational and and showing that I think that there's a sense of inevitability to this, that this process of decentralization, that hopefully we will live to see um, something like panarchy or at least uh, the dissolution of hierarchical nation state structures in our time. No promises. I'm not a soothsayer, but we all have to live the self-fulfilling prophecy and we're doing it right now, being here interacting with each other in positive ways. This is the start of it. I truly believe that. Well, we'll be looking forward to that. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Hope everyone has a great night. Definitely check out uh, the, uh, the our new edition of Panarchy in the library at Liberty Me. I'll link that again in chat in just a minute here. And thanks so much again. Have a great night. Thanks for coming, Max. Thank you, guys. I had a blast. I hope to have you back. Take care.